OK, so let's get started. OK, so this is lecture two of ECE 503. And in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about the important concept of analog to digital and digital analog conversion. OK, so the, um, on this slide, what you see is essentially um, nothing too fancy, but it's a block diagram of an analog digital digital analog converter. And what I'm going to do after, like, you know, sort of like going through the basic components is uh, of, the, of this implementation is, you know, usually I learn graphically. So um, what I'm going to do is give a little bit of a different angle by going step by step, um, every stage of the way, how this implementation works. All right? So what we have in an analog to digital converter, as I mentioned before, is first of all, you have input, you have your continuous time or analog waveform. And the first thing I do is I sample it. I make it into discrete time waveform. Boop, 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 boop. So I only take a subsample. I take a finite number of samples from that continuum of samples across time. And, and in order for my uh, system to process or to deal with it. But that's not good enough. Because every one of those samples have a continuum, an infinite number of amplitude values, which still does not help me in the digital domain. So what I do is I then quantize it. Just like I sample into a finite number of time instances of that waveform, I now assign that continuum of amplitude values that come into my quantizer. My quantizer essentially maps it to the closest of one of several finite number of amplitude values that I want to deal with in my system. Once I have taken my waveform and broken it down or re-represented it, like basically finite number of samples across time, finite number of possible amplitude values per sample, the last and most important step, or not most important, they're all important, is the coder. The coder says, oh, at this time instant, you are what amplitude value? Oh, you're 3.3 volts? You have a representation of 10100010 one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, whatever, right? Because what does a computer, like, you know, in the end, at the end of the day, what information does a microprocessor or any sort of computing device deal with? Ones and zeros. It's all binary, right? So that's where the coder, the coder maps every uh, every one of those finite number of amplitude values to a binary representation. And then that binary representation goes to your microprocessing device for whatever. And, and your computer or your DSP chip or your FPGA or whatever knows how to handle those patterns of ones and zeros. OK. So actually, I, that I think is worth a little bit of doodling about. OK, so let's doodle. And if you think my handwriting is bad, my, my doodling's even worse. OK. So again, let's, let's look at this. So first of all, we have our sampler. Mm -hmm. Then we have our quantizer, which is the universal symbol for quantizer is that step-looking thing. Then it's my coder. OK. So let's, let's do this first. OK. So actually, before that. So let's, first of all, we have analog waveform. Now what happens is we have um, you know, your, your, your discrete waveform, right? So you have n. Then what happens is you have your, your quantized waveform. So I'm going to put q of n. And then your coder, well, this is now just a binary sequence. So I'm just going to represent it by b. So what does this all mean? So again, so let's say we take our continuous time waveform. OK, looks like that. And, and then what ends up happening is the sampler, what the sampler does is says, OK, I'm going to take each one of these instances and throw out all the information elsewhere. 
So this point I keep, this point I keep, this point I keep, this point I keep, so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, at this point here, what I've got now is I have essentially, um, I guess the term is called stems. I have these stems that represent those samples. Okay, So now, this is my discrete time signal. But it's not digital. And the reason for it is I still have a continuum of amplitude values for each one of those sample points. Totally useless still by a microprocessor standard because I do not have an infinite amount of memory. right? And just think about it, even if I did have an infinite no amount of memory, the search time it would take to discover the exact amplitude representation to represent by ones and zeros, which would be infinite because you have infinite number of amplitude values, would be uh, un un uh, you know, not conceivable. So what the quantizer does is the following. The quantizer says you can only assume these possible amplitude values. So let's say we have a really, really um, not top of the line quantizer, right? So <laughs> I'm trying to be polite. Um, so let's say um, my quantizer only represents one of four possible amplitude values, A1, A2, A3, A4. So what, what my quantizer basically says is these are the only amplitude values that my waveform can assume. So it does basically a nearest neighbor association. So what it will do is it will say, ah, this point here, it's close to A2. This point here is close to A2. So is him and him. Him, he's an A3. This is the tricky part. I would say this guy here is an A3. He, well, let's say I have bad eyesight, is closer to an A4. So at the end of the day, at this point here, what do I have? What I now have is this guy, he has an amplitude value of A2. This guy, amplitude value of A2. This guy, amplitude value of A3. And back to A2 for him and him. He has A4 and back to A3. So now what I have is um, a waveform that has a discrete number of samples. And it also has a discrete number of amplitude values. Now, how do I use this? So this coding thing is the last step. And what the coder does says, OK, I have four possible amplitude values. A1 can be represented by 0, 0. A2 can be represented by 0, 1. A3 can be represented by 1, 0. A4 can be represented by 1, 1. So now, at this point, what I have is I don't have stem plots. I don't have amplitude values anymore. What I've got is, uh, let's see, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. So, so at the end, you have binary data. That's now something that your uh, microprocessor system, DSP, FPGA, CUDA, you name it can handle. And, and you might say, OK, well, well, Professor, where did you get the associations from? Well, that is the first stem. That is the amplitude of the second stem. That is the amplitude of the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And in fact, what happens is um, your um, analog digital converter, it's taking in a continuum of data, right? Like, so your radio. Your whatever, your sensing device that's translating into digital data, all of that stuff, even your cell phones, like, um, and not your, the wireless part, but the speech part, speech coders and the like, what happens is your human speech, that's an analog waveform. What happens is you speak into the mic, and what the mic is doing is doing exactly this. It's quantizing stuff, and it's making it ones and zeros so that the speech signal processing algorithms do their magic in order to compress your speech signal and send it over the air to whoever you're speaking to, right? So what happens is what um, the process of analog to digital conversion essentially does is these three steps. 
And this is an oversimplification. There are actually some really complicated analog digital converters out there. But for the most part, understanding how that mapping goes from uh, continuous time analog waveform to ones and zeros, this is essentially that process, right? So if you can, asso if you can associate that in terms of that mapping, like, you know, uh, you're already there. And then there's a variety of, like, for instance, that quantizer, we're going to be talking about uniform quantizers. But uh, there are a variety of different other types of quantizers out there, like the non-uniform variety. And usually it's specific to the type of waveform you're trying to quantize, right? Because there are things like quantization error. Sampling, um, there are a number of ways that you can represent it mathematically. Um, my favorite is called uh, impulse train sampling representation, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then coding, again, coding depending on the application, right? Because some cases, what happens is, uh, for instance, uh, both your quantizer and your coder might be optimized to whatever specific waveform you're dealing with, right? So let's say a specific amplitude. So for instance, let's say my waveform. So here's sort of a practical insight question. So let's say my waveform seldomly has amplitude values here, but very often has amplitude values here at that level. Do you think a uniform quantizer is smart? No. I would be putting, if I had only four amplitude values, I would put most of my eggs into the lower frequency basket, uh, lower amplitude basket. I would try and get higher enough resolution where most of my information, most of my stems are going to be appearing. And then the higher one, I would just allocate one level and say, la, I did have a high amplitude stem at one point, and just, just call it as that. And, and so that's how I would design the quantizer. And your coder would work in unison with that. Like for instance, uh, like, uh, for instance, like you know, sometimes you might want to choose these like sort of uniform patterns, but there are different types of coders out there, um, um, and and you can compress it. Like you know, if you have like long patterns of ones and zeros, maybe there's some opportunity to remove redundancy somehow. So um, this is just a very simple mapping of a coder. But you also have um, combined with the um, um, quantizer, you have uh, uh, product quantizers and vector quantizers where um, you're you, they're a little bit more complicated, and they also deal with different types of representations of waveforms. So we won't talk about that too much in this course. OK. Seems like there's a fire out there. OK. And this is being recorded online, too. So, um, so the first thing I talked about is the uh, sampler, right? And so uh, just like what I described before, um, the best way to describe a sampling of an analog signal is essentially um, you can have x of n, your discrete time signal, is equal to your analog signal where um, n is basically multiplied by t. So what this means is essentially uh, every time, like let's say what's n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Let's say discrete time instant 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What I'm basically doing is I'm sampling every like, you know, basically at t increments of my analog waveform and discarding the rest. So, so essentially, if I say, what's x1? Well, x1 is xa at t, the first sampling time instant. What is x2? x2 is essentially xa 2t. So two sampling periods into my waveform, that's the value I'm acquiring. I don't care about anything in between. Those, unfortunately, are discarded, right? A lot of folks like to represent sampling by this little swing arm representation. So every time, every t seconds, boom, give me a sample, boom, give me a sample, boom, give me a sample, boop, 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 and continuously. So this arm is going on and on and on and on. Again, like what I mentioned, I'm not a super, like, you know, this is one way of representing it, but there's another mathematical way of representing this as well, which I'll draw right now. And that way is the following. Ah, no, 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 no. Yep. Bless you. So what ends up happening is what I like to call it is the impulse impulse train model. Okay. So the way this works is suppose you have your continuous time waveform. X A of T. 
And what I do is I use an uh, impulse train generator. Okay, And this produces a signal. Uh, okay, fine. I'm going to use S of t. I was actually planning to use P of t, but S of t is good. And this produces x of t. And so what is s of t? s of t is the following. s of t is nothing more than the summation of k from minus infinity to plus infinity okay, of delta t minus, uh, OK, come on, behave, k t. And let's say t s. That's your sampling period. Okay. So what you essentially have is, let's say, using a different color, that's your continuous time waveform, right? T. This guy here, he's also continuous time. Well, he, at least in the analog domain. But what happens is he's a Dirac delta function. He's non-zero at one specific infinitesimally small point and zero everywhere else. And you might say, well, professor, why is there all these other deltas. Well, it's the sum that I have here. So essentially, I'm taking one tiny little Dirac function, and then I'm adding another non-overlapping Dirac function. Oh, and then I'm taking another non-overlapping Dirac function, and so on and so forth, adding together. And they're all spaced out by multiples of t. So they look like a train of deltas. <laughs> Don't go to the Worcester train station and say, can I take the delta train? No, no, they'll, they'll. And don't mention my name either. I don't want like law enforcement after me. So, so what, what happens is, this is kind of the interesting point. What happens when you multiply the two together? What happens when you multiply something by 0? Zippo. What happens if you multiply, in this case, those deltas are all at 1. What happens if I multiply them against a waveform? It assumes the amplitude of that waveform at that specific instant and 0 everywhere else. So that, ladies and gentlemen, will produce a, a string of deltas that have an envelope that looks like xA of t, but ha are only defined at instances defined by the deltas of s of t. So this, so you could do the boop, 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 you know, the swinging arm sample thing every t seconds model. Or mathematically, you can have this. And this has a lot of power behind this representation. Because like, um, we're not going to show it in today's class, unless everybody really, really wants me to show it. Um, but um, you might wonder, OK, mathematically, why is it in continuous time, if we look spectrally, and, and this might go into a little bit more detail than we want to talk about today. Spectrally, a continuous time waveform, you have the shape, let's say it's band limited, and you just have the spectrum of your signal and, and nothing else for, from minus infinity to infinity. But why is it when you sample it, you get periodic replicas, periodic replicas, every multiple of the sampling instant? It's because of this. And we'll, we'll get to it. There's like looking at the world in terms of an impulse train model will actually mathematically help show that, in fact, you can show that there's a reason why when you sample, and you sample like this, you actually get uh, replicas every sampling instant. Or if you use radians per second, you actually get it every 2 pi. You have a replica and a replica and a replica. And then that leads into our discussion of aliasing. Again, I'm talking w way more ahead than I should be. Okay? But, but for now, you can do sampling. And again, try this out at home. Well, except for the fact that MATLAB does not do continuous time, great. But mathematically, what you have is you have your uh, train of Dirac delta functions. You have your continuous waveform. You multiply the two together, and you get this. So the envelope looks like your uh, original continuous time waveform, but it's essentially a train of deltas. And then it's very easy to then take the amplitude of those deltas and say, OK, map it to a specific amplitude. That's where your quantization kicks in, right? So you have your, your Dirac function, where for every Dirac function, what is the closest amplitude in my possible values of amplitude? Uh, like, you know, our, my, my, my bank of possible amplitude values. And then you map it to that. And then from that, you say, oh, 
that amplitude value has a binary representation of 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, whatever. Actually, uh, just as an aside, when people talk about analog, digital, digital, analog conversions, uh, converters, they talk about resolution, right? 16-bit, 14-bit, yada, yada, yada. That's, that's what I'm talking about in terms of um, um, in, with respect to uh, the representation of amplitude values. So if you want to know how many amplitude values your analog, digital, digital, analog converter is, it's basically uh, 2 to the whatever number of bits representation, your resolution of your analog, digital, digital, analog converter. So if someone says, I have a 16-bit um, uh, digital to analog converter, well, OK, so that means every amplitude value has a unique 16-bit uh, bit pattern, right? So how many possible combinations there are, binary-wise? So that will tell you about the number of quantization, oh, amplitude values, quantization levels that are available in your analog digital converter, all right? All right, a little potpourri right there. Now, beep, 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 beep. So, um, some things to be mindful of. So what happens is the relationship between the analog frequency parameters, you know, in the continuous time, and discrete time frequency parameters are the following. So, so essentially, um, so this again ties into this idea of when you sample, you have periodic replicas and such. And we usually, when we look at um, discrete time frequency representations, we almost always look at minus pi to pi when we normalize according to uh, discrete, uh, you know, the discrete frequency in radians per second. Um, but look at physically what we're doing in terms of going from a continuous time domain to a uh, discrete time domain in terms of like, you know, the big F and little f. What the sampling frequency does in part is we're normalizing um, that analog or continuous time f normalizing it by the sampling frequency. So everything is actually now becoming a function of the sampling frequency. And what we're left with is this little f. And so when you deal with, uh, you know, um, discrete time spectra, frequency representations, we, when we bring up little f, what, what we're essentially doing is we actually, it has a relevance to the continuous time. And it's then whatever your sampling rate is, your, your, or in this case, your sampling frequency, f of s, what it does is it normalizes it. And what you're going to find out is if your signal is band limited, which means it doesn't go all the way to plus infinity and minus infinity. It's nicely contained within a specific frequency range. Uh, you can define limits. And then there's also rules on how to choose your sampling frequency, such that everything is nicely contained without any overlapping. That, that's something called aliasing. And again, we'll get to that in a little bit. OK. So um, again, the, the, what I mentioned before is that in the continuous time, your frequency representations stretch from minus infinity to infinity, but your discrete time representation only goes, like, let's say if you have little f from minus a half to a half, or in the case of the um, uh, radians per second representation, minus pi to pi. Okay? And I, I find that this description here is a little bit convoluted. And um, again, this comes down to this idea of, um, like, you know, why, why is this? Like, you know, why, um, like, you know, th this sort of like uh, uh, folding frequencies? And, and I think it's, it's probably better answered by the what happens when we sample from, um, uh, we sample a continuous time waveform by, by impulse train. What, what's actually happening? What are we actually seeing? So again, I'm just going to go back to here. And so I actually wrote out something that kind of helps to articulate this. So let's say we take that impulse train model, right? So suppose we have, again, we have our analog waveform. Okay. And this time I'm going to use P, P of T. So P of T is the same as S of T in the last case. And then what we have at the output is we have X. S of t. And so uh, p of t, as we saw before, is equal to k is equal to minus infinity to infinity. So these are integer values. And here's our Dirac function, k t s. And so now what happens is, so what we're doing here is essentially x of, mm, Select. Come on. 
I guess I'm going to have to delete all of it. Ah, I'm going to redraw it. Okay. So P of T. So X of S of T is equal to X of A of T times P of T. All right? So suppose we now go into the frequency domain. What do we have? So if we go into the frequency domain, so let's say we take the Fourier transform. What do we have? So what happens when we have multiplication in the time domain? We have convolution in the frequency domain, right? So that means, let's say we have S, uh, uh, x of s of omega is equal to x of a of omega convolved with p of omega. Now, the big question is, what does p of omega look like? Well, p of omega. Okay. Or uh, so let's say we take p of t. So let's take the if we take the Fourier transform of this guy. So we take the Fourier transform. So if we we apply the Fourier transform, what we notice is that um, the Fourier transform of a train of deltas is equal to a train of deltas in the frequency domain. Okay. And and the reason for that is again like think about it. So we have um, if we take the Fourier transform. Um, depending, like um, what you do is, let's say if you pick a continuous time Fourier transform, which is say an integral of the function p of t e to the j two pi f of t, right? D of t. What what happens when you integrate a delta? The basically the the integration, and if you do this in discrete time, the summation, everything is zero except at what the delta is equal to, right? So think about it. The integration is an infinite sum. And then you have the regular sum as well. And all of that is zero except that where the delta is not zero at. So, so just as an aside, if I were to integrate from minus infinity to infinity delta t, and let's say I have some function. Let's say it's y of t dt. What is this equal to? y of 0, right? Do people remember that, y of 0? Why is that? Because the delta here is 1 only when t is equal to 0, right? And 0 otherwise. So the integral, why integrate anything? Because there's only one value that's non-zero. Everything else is multiplied by 0. In this case, what you've got is you've got a train of deltas. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of interesting. So if, let's say we take the Fourier transform. <coughs> oh, there's those police again. Welcome to Worcester. Um, and you have P of t, right? So the, this big fancy f that I have here is the Fourier transform. The first trick that I would do is by, because summation, you know, it's a linear operation, what I can do is I can actually take the Fourier transform of each individual delta. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I have the Fourier transform of delta, let's say take the first term, t. Um, let's say the Fourier transform of delta t plus ts plus the Fourier transform of delta t minus ts and so on from minus infinity to infinity. So I basically am taking the Fourier transform of every term and summing them together. And so what do I get at the end of the day? What I get at the end of the day, okay, if we do this representation is essentially like if you take the Fourier transform um, and, and you rewrite it, you actually get, um, um, okay, so, so what, what you're going to get is essentially Time shifted, you're going to get shifted versions. Like if you apply the definition of the Fourier transform, you're going to essentially get frequency sh shifted versions of delta in, in their place. Okay, So if you, if you have this train of deltas and you take the Fourier transforms and you break it down into individual Fourier transforms, you apply the Fourier transforms, you sum it back together, what the, you, you get at the end of the day is a train of deltas, but not in the time domain anymore. Now you actually get a train of deltas in the frequency domain. What you, you get, and that's an exercise for a student, so EFTS, 
is essentially, oh, do I have more space? No, darn. What you end up getting, if you do this operation, okay, my apologies, I'm writing all over the place, is you get P of W, uh, sorry, not W, omega. It's actually omega. And then you have 2 pi Ts summation from k equals minus infinity to plus infinity delta omega minus k 2 pi Ts. All right? And in fact, um, this guy we can rewrite as omega s, the sampling frequency. So now what you've got is you're taking uh, x a of omega. And, uh, so let, let me erase this and make it control a delete. What you're essentially doing now is okay. So now I have uh, x omega is equal to x a omega convolved with p of omega. So graphically, what does this look like? This guy here. Suppose he looks like this, you know, your generic waveform from minus, um, uh, let me think, omega 1 to plus omega 1 and centered at 0. This guy here actually is a train of deltas in the frequency domain. Okay. And it's spaced out at 0. And omega s, 2 omega s, 3 omega s, minus omega s, minus 2 omega s, da 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 da, da da da. What happens when you convolve this guy and this guy? You basically have copy, 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 copy. Exactly. Modul you get modulation. Exactly. But on a very large scale, from minus infinity to infinity. And more interesting, if Let's say, depending on how band limited uh, that this signal is here, okay, um, one of two things can happen. What are those things? So those things can be one of the two. Oop. So you can either have you can either have if let's say the triangle is sufficiently narrow enough, you have this. Right, because of the, the, the modulation, because of the uh, of, of of the convolution with the deltas. Okay. On the other hand, what happens if the, the 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 signal is not sufficiently band limited enough? So what, what ends up happening is you get this phenomenon, and this is really bad news in the DSP world. This is called aliasing. Okay. So what ends up happening is is that whenever like and, and so this requires a little bit of um, you know a little bit of understanding about what you're dealing with in terms of your input continuous time waveform, what is its spectral representation, and then choosing the right sampling rate, right? So if you don't choose the sampling correctly. Um, because the sampling is very much tied to um, how your digital representation looks like at the end of the day. If you don't choose correctly, you get this overlap, and then a situation like this becomes very difficult in order to extract the original signal from. On the other hand, this, the situation above, that's what we're all striving for, is nicely individual, nice individual re repetitive patterns with no overlap, because then uh, if I ever want to reconstruct the waveform and send it back into the continuous time domain, I have no aliasing to contend with, no interference. All right? And now, and, and so what happens is, this goes back to the question, and, and there was all that funky mathematics that was kind of confusing, like, you know, about uh, uh, folding frequencies and the like. Well, well, it really comes down to when you sample your spectrum representation, you, you no longer have, here's your frequency representation and nothingness from minus infinity to infinity, what you now have is replica, 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 replica. And so as a result, we have to be very careful 
where we draw the line in terms of, okay, we're dealing with this replica only, and we're not dealing with anyone else because everything periodically repeats itself from minus infinity to infinity. So we only really need to focus on the one. We also have to be very mindful, again, about avoiding aliasing at all costs. Otherwise, our job of recovering any information without distortion is almost impossible. All right? Okay. Yay. So, um, so that kind of explains this slide. So it's a little bit convoluted, not convolved, convoluted. So I just wanted to, um, um, you know, kind of represent it that way. And again, aliasing is, is going to be, um, I think you say it in French, uh, bête noire. This is going to be the beast that will follow you throughout this entire course, and you have to be very careful about. Yeah. So see, uh, this is the second time I mentioned aliasing. So what happens is, so that first block of three, when we talk about uh, analog, digital, digital, analog converters, um, is this idea that we, uh, we have some sort of module that samples, 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 samples at some rate. In this course, for the most part, we're only going to be dealing with uniform sampling devices and such. It, it, like there are situations where you do non-uniform sampling, like sample, 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 sample. Way, way too difficult. It's like the math there is incredibly out of this world. So we're only going to deal with you know, uniform sampling for the most part in this course. So um, sampling theory uh, really comes down to, like, um, to the following. So suppose you're a designer of a system. You want to measure an analog quantity. You want to digitize it and perform signal processing on it. And so what ends up happening is um, you're told what the like, let's say this is a band-limited signal that you're dealing with. What should your sampling be? Because you really, OK, so as an engineer, what are the things that we can play with? Can we play with the actual signal that we're measuring? Absolutely not, um, unless you go up to the thing that's creating that signal and say, hey, can you do this? Impossible. So we cannot in any way touch the thing we're trying to measure. It's there. All we can do is design a better mousetrap. All we can do is design our digital signal processor, our whiz bang, our device for measuring that signal, and we can tweak it to give the best possible performance. So can we touch the band with, if you will, the analog signal? Absolutely not. But we can touch the sampling rate, right? So that's where we do play. So let's suppose it's band limited. So again, like, oh my dear. So I'm going back to this, this uh, graph here. So this guy here, for instance. Ah, no, actually, let's, let's not mu muddle things up. Ah, boop. Ah, thank goodness. OK, so here, suppose you are you're trying to measure some sort of voltage or some temperature, which temperature would be fitting this time of year. And so suppose you're told, oh, yeah, it, the bandwidth is from F minus F max to plus F max. And here's 0, and that's the frequency, right? So what are you going to do in order to make sure that when you measure and you digitize this, you have 0 aliasing whatsoever? What are you going to do? How are you going to sample? Remember, when we sample, we take this waveform, and then it repeats, right? So like, imagine we now get rid of this guy here. We get rid of that guy. And instead, it's like, OK, we know that he has a certain width, right? And then, oh, OK, now we have to choose um, you know, how, like how, how like, you know, our sampling frequency will dictate how far apart these guys are spaced. If we don't choose wisely, they begin overlapping and the aliasing occurs, right? So as a result, the onus is on us. If we know what the waveform looks like in the frequency domain, we choose FS such that it's sufficiently spaced apart that we don't have aliasing. Remember, aliasing is a bad word in this course. <laughs> so in order to accomplish that, what we need to do is we need to develop some concepts on choosing the sampling frequency correctly. OK? So uh, first of all, um, yeah, the conversion uh, changes the frequency range from minus infinity to infinity to minus a half to a half. And that if we don't choose FS correctly, we, we have aliasing. 
Ah, I overshot. Yep. So again, so this is, it's actually kind of interesting because there are some tricks, this might be on the quiz next week, of like, you know, what does it mean to be band limited? This is actually the classic um, sampling uh, question trick that uh, lots of people use uh, all the time in, in courses and the like. And so I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean. So for instance, let's suppose that your analog waveform, let's suppose that your analog waveform looks like this. Your continuous time waveform looks like this. What is the bandwidth, the analog bandwidth of this guy? Is it him? And if you said that, you would be wrong. It's all of this. That white space here, that's part of the bandwidth. But, ooh, but really what matters here is from n to n, from negative, the negative limit of your used frequency to the positive limit of your used frequency, that is actually the entire signal bandwidth. Because sure, you can design, you can design um, sample, samplers where, suppose we call this uh, left hand half of uh, the signal, and that's your right hand half. And we can, let's say, then sample this guy, and we can actually maybe even fit left hand guy of the replica, and here's your right hand guy of the replica, and here's your right hand side of replica, and the left hand side of replica, and then in turn, oh my dear, you have left hand side of replica, and right hand side of replica, and right hand side replica, and left hand side replica, and so on and so forth, but that's aliasing. What you're essentially doing is, here's your occupied spectrum, including any dead space in the middle, and you have something going into it, even if it's not landing on some non-zero portion, it is still aliasing. So if I, if, let's say next week, I give you a quiz and I say, what is your sampling uh, rate in order to prevent aliasing? And I give you a waveform just like this. There might be, like this is a good litmus test to see if anyone's listening. And what happens is, if I see people overlapping like that, eh, aliasing. It might be efficient. You might be using up the spectrum in a much nicer, more efficient way, packing everything together, but it's still aliasing. Very hard to deal with. So. That's one classic example. So don't do, like, you know, really, really, like, don't fall for it. It's like, you know, what is the bandwidth? Like, so, so that's, that's one case in point, right? So this is aliasing. <sighs> so, um, so, so what we want to do in, in terms of um, what we, in order to achieve a no aliasing scenario, is we want to get something, we basically want to choose the Nyquist rate. So Nyquist rate essentially is, um, in this case, you have your sampling frequency, and it is twice the frequency of the, the width of your, the, the analog signal that you are sampling. That way, what happens is, if you notice it, it intuitively it makes sense. Here's your bandwidth. Imagine your sampling, your sampling uh, rate, um, f of s, is where you are going to have your replica centered at and multiples of f of s. So what's the buffer? So let's say half your bandwidth, and then, OK, well, we need to be twice half of those bandwidths away, and then another twice of those bandwidths away, and so on and so forth. What we need to do, essentially, is we need to, uh, to space things out by twice the maximum bandwidth of that continuous time waveform in order to be safe. We can even make it more wider, but you know that's not as efficient. We want to be close, but we don't want to overlap either. All right? OK. And then people always ask, how do you get that digital waveform back? <laughs> you know, you, you might think, well, I sampled it. There's no way. There is a way. There is a way. And the way is, is you, you, you basically take your impulses. Because here's, here's the beauty of using Dirac functions. What happens is if you feed a delta into a system with a specific impulse, uh, impulse shape, uh, impulse response, what do you get at the output? The impulse response, right? So uh, again, that, that I really want to draw because it's kind of like uh, a trip down memory lane. Boop. So what you have is the following. 
if I have as an input, so let's say here's my black box, okay? And suppose I have something that looks like, like this. And suppose I feed into that system, I feed in a delta, okay? And that's my impulse response. Yeah. Okay, what do I have at the output? And the answer is the impulse response, right? What, 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 is, what is the impulse response? It's the response of that box to being fed an impulse, being fed a delta. So what we do is, let's say a box like that, how, how do I trigger an output? What, how do I flush out the impulse response? I feed in a delta. So what I do is I say, delta, what is the output? And what comes out would be what we call the impulse response of that system. Okay. So at the output, what we get is something that looks like that over there. Okay. Now what's interesting is in the case of doing the digital to analog conversion, what we need to do is the following. We need to take uh, that uh, delta Dirac uh, impulse train with the specific amplitude values, right, the impulse trains, and we feed it into this case something called a um, sync impulse response. So what is a sync impulse response? And it's not sync with a K, it's sync with a C, okay? Yeah, I would hate to see a sync impulse response and syncs start flying out. That would be bad. Uh, okay, only if you own a home do you guys appreciate me. No, just kidding. So, uh, what, what it means is everyone should know what a sync pulse is, right? Pew! That beautiful waveform, right? From minus infinity to infinity. So, essentially, um, if you take the Fourier transform of a sync, uh, sync impulse response, what you get is a beautiful square wave, right? And then you know about Gibbs phenomena. So, let, let me go, let me again do an aside as to um, these wonderful things. So a sync pulse looks like, ah, oh, darn. A sync pulse looks like this, right? Essentially, it's sine x over x. And we know that if, let's say, we take the Fourier transform of that in the frequency domain, we get a uh, you know, square wave, right? And we all know, or we should know, what happens is if we abruptly end the sync pulse. Let's say we just say, oh, I'm only going to take the first few seconds from either side of this thing and forget about the rest. Um, you get the well-known phenomenon called Gibbs phenomenon. What happens is you don't get a perfect square. What you do is you have these guys here because those tails, you need them to go from minus infinity to infinity. Otherwise, you don't get perfectly rectangular shape. You get these little wiggly things at the transitions. You don't get a perfect sharp edge going down and, and, so, and so. And and in fact, this is actually kind of a problem because um, if we use a sync impulse response, what's the problem with a sync impulse response? Do we have infinite time to watch the sync pulse settle? No, right? So we're going to have a little bit of imperfection. It won't be perfectly a sync pulse. OK. So so suppose we do have a perfect sync pulse. What ends up happening is if we feed that delta train into it, we get this magical property for a sync pulse, which is the following. Um, so we have one sync pulse, and then the nice thing about sync pulse is that at every other sampling instant, right? So, so he, at this point, at this point, at this point. So it's kind of interesting. What ends up happening is you have a non-zero value here, and then at every other sampling instant that basically where your delta is appearing, it's a zero crossing. And then you have another sync pulse overlaid because that's caused by the delayed delta that comes right after this delta, and it flushes out another sync pulse impulse response. And then the delta delayed after that flushes out another impulse response, and so on and so forth, such that at the end, what you've got is a continuum of different heights of sync pulses all added together. And what, you, what that ends up doing, it has this beautiful property of creating this nice, smooth curve that flows through every point 
Right, so let's say you take that, this uh, impulse train, each one of those amplitude values, what this does essentially is draws this beautiful line through every one of those amplitude values in a smooth, continuous wave, and you get your, uh, anal uh, your continuous time waveform back. Now, um, you might say, why sync pulses? And there is something called uh, Nyquist pulse shapes. And so um, the, the sync pulses in particular are very nice because um, when, when you use it in this way and you don't have any aliasing, what it essentially it does is you, you have those zero crossings, which are really helpful. Um, essentially, it, it does this sort of curve fitting, but it does this curve fitting in a very nice, smooth, transitional way. It's not zero order or first order where you're drawing these jagged lines from point to point to point. What you get is this nice continuum that flows gracefully between different points to actually recreate your continuous time waveform. All right? So that's, that's the, so that's why we use sync pulses. How many people are, here have seen sync pulses before? Sync pulses, raise your hands. Raise your hands, sync pulses. Okay. So exercise for, for, for a class, read up on sync pulses. Okay. No, seriously, sync pulses are, are really awesome. Sine x over x. Nobody's seen sine x over x? Sine x over, okay. Just in case, my, like maybe it's my Canadian accent and people are like getting confused. Let's, let's do this. So how many people have seen this? Raise hands so I can see them. OK. OK, so you're a very quiet class. OK, good. <laughs> OK, I just want to make sure. Also gives a chance to stretch your arms, get the blood flowing, you know. No, yeah, but that's the last thing I want to see happen. So, OK. So, um, so that's why we do that. And then I mentioned about uh, the quantization. And again, this, this slide here pretty much describes what I did the last time by um, essentially mapping um, all those, that continuum of possible amplitude values to a discrete set of possible amplitude values. So basically, it uses a nearest neighbor approach in order to map these guys to one of po these possible amplitude value levels. And just like what I mentioned before, so if you have like an analog to digital converter and they say it has 14-bit resolution, what it's basically saying is you have 2 to the 14 possible amplitude values for your quantizer to map amplitude values to, okay? So um, there, there is actually quite a bit of literature on quantization theory in general. We'll touch about it, touch about, touch on it a little bit more later in this course. But um, if you're interested, because what happens is, what happens when you do quantization? You're introducing also uh, some distortion, right? Because you're rounding. You're rounding to the nearest amplitude that's in the database, right, into your code book or whatever in your quantizer. And you're cutting off um, you know, the remaining amount of amplitude that doesn't quite fit there. And that, that creates a little bit of distortion. So it's almost like. I'm going to take everything and quantize it by, to integers. So I give you 3.1. What's well, 3? Uh, 5.7. It's 6. Um, 6.9. It's 7. But what ends up happening is one of those little differences I'm just throwing away, that introduces something called quantization error. So there is a metric. Just like we have signal to noise ratio and signal to interference and noise ratio, we have something called signal to quantization noise ratio. And I think the course textbook on section 1.4.4 does a great job trying to articulate what is signal to quantization noise ratio. So definitely take a look at that. All right. Last but not least, and so this again I talked a little bit about, is notice how when, when I quantize that continuum of amplitude values to only a, 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 you know, a definite finite set of amplitude values, I then associate each amplitude value with a set of ones and zeros. And so depending on, like for instance, I mentioned the analog digital converter with 14-bit resolution. What happens is when I say, oh, you're mapped to this amplitude value, it produces a 14-bit word that then gets sent to the processor, right? And then the next amplitude value, oh, OK, you're that amplitude. Here's another 14-bit pattern this code word that then is sent next, and so on and so forth. 
So what the coding does is essentially translates that finite number of amplitude values to a binary pattern, right? And again, there are different ways of doing coding. This is sort of the most straightforward way of doing that. Okay. Yeah, and I didn't, we're going to talk more about this again later in the class, but there are other techniques to doing digital to analog conversion, right? Um, so let, let, me, let me give us an example. So for instance, we have things like um, my favorite. So let's say you have this, 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 and I want, to con I want to convert it back into an analog waveform. What can you do? You can do things like zero order hold, which basically turns everything into a brick wall, right? So that's zero order hold. Um, I can also do like linear, um, a, a linear form of, um, of, of um, B to A conversion where basically I take every sample point and its amplitude value and just connect the dots. I can also do like second order where I can fit a parabola into each one of them. My, or you can even do things like spline. Spline is, is really cool. So spline. And spline basically attempts to curve fit as much as possible each one of those points. So spline, if, I'm not sure if you're exposed to anyone who's a civil engineer, but spline kind of is similar to the idea of the French curve. Oh, I love French curves. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen this. This is actually a drawing tool. So if you've ever taken a drawing course, yeah, like that. And then you have this. So if you have a civil engineer in the family, so my father is a civil engineer, you most likely found in the drawer at home something that looks like this. So what ends up happening is suppose you're doing a plan and you have two or three dots, four dots, five dots, six dots, and you just don't want to draw a line because it looks very unelegant. You want it to fit very nicely. You would have one of these. It's called a French curve. What a French curve does, it has all these different curves and stuff you would basically take a segment and say, I'm going to connect these two dots with this segment of the French curve. Oh, I have this other dot coming up. You take, a, let's say, a steeper version or a more curved version of the French curve and draw that. It's, an, it's a wonderful uh, tool if you ever want to do that. Nowadays, we have computers and stuff, so we, that art's almost lost. But um, check it out on Wikipedia if you have the time. Okay. Anyways, so that concludes uh, lecture two of ECE uh, 503. So uh, uh, in this lecture, we covered um, analog to digital, digital analog conversion, and all the different modules that make, make up this technology. So this really forms the basis between the mapping of the continuous time and the discrete time world. Uh, and without these devices, we would essentially not be able to do DSP whatsoever. So this is actually a really core technology. It also is what drives the cost of certain devices. So if you have a really high horsepower analog, digital, digital analog conversion, uh, converters, um, that can drive the cost of your product way high. So you have to be mindful of that cost-benefit analysis. Okay? So that, that concludes this part of, uh, of, of the lecture. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take um, uh, just a, a two, three